my name is Bradley Steinfeld. I work for IBM. Uh, and I'm here to present to you uh, about user experience and simplicity and just how important they are. And hopefully by the end, I'll either reinforce or convince to you how they're probably the most important thing you're going to work on. And at the end of it, I'm going to show you the tool that I actually created and I'm working on called B-Charts. And hopefully I'll convince you as well uh, that with B-Charts, truly anyone can be a data scientist. So first of all, you might be wondering, you know, why, why is IBM here talking about user experience and, and, and simplicity? Uh, you know, why am I here talking about this? So in order to understand, I'm going to give you a, a quick brief history on IBM, uh, or at least uh, my version of it. Uh, don't tell any executives. Uh, so I joined IBM about 11 years ago, and when I joined, the big focus on IBM was really about, you know, shoving as many bits into your database as possible. It was about doing the fastest database joins. It was really about tons of data and processing it really fast. But the problem is when you, when you actually wanted to do things with your data, when you wanted to you know, create a chart, who would be involved? It would be kind of a, a kludgy, complex process. You'd likely need a developer to create some SQL code, uh, pull some data out of a database, pass that data to a business analyst who would take that data, work with it, plop it into a tool like Excel, create the reports. It, it took a long time and it was very cumbersome. So soon after I joined IBM, about 10 years ago, uh, it was quite obvious to everybody that we needed a way to, to start looking through, like, you know, terabytes, petabytes of data and create, you know, useful uh, visualizations, useful charts, useful reports. Uh, so the focus really shifted at IBM from just making, you know, the fastest stuff we can, although it's always important, but to know how are we going to use this data, how are we going to analyze it in a much more, you know, user-friendly way. Uh, at the time, we actually acquired a company called Cognos. We still have it. It's awesome today. It's our BI tool for business intelligence. And what it let a business analyst do without a developer and without having to create any code, it allowed them to click, 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 create their database models. And through, you know, a quite a, a little process, they had to know how to use the tool, they could create their charts and create their reports without any help. So that was, that was really cool and it was a big deal back then. Uh, but recently, the focus has changed uh, at IBM. And, you know, IBM is a huge company. We're 385,000 people all around the world. Change happens slow. But I can say from personal experience, I see this change each and every day that I, <laughs> that I, that I work at my job. And, and I think a lot of other people are. We're having a, a new focus on design, on the user, on the user experience. Uh, we're having design thinking principles and user-centered design. It's really important for us because, you know, we're not necessarily even at the forefront of this. We, we just realize, based on, you know, what's happening with the world, with the cloud, with cognitive, with other companies, that the focus now needs to be a little bit less on the te technology and more on you, the user, whoever's actually using the tools. So hopefully our goal is to, when we ask the question is, who's going to create the charts? We don't want to say you need to learn a tool and be a business analyst or a data scientist. The goal really is that everyone should be creating charts. So the idea is that the focus is really on you, on the user. So who are you? Who is the user? And honestly, the user can be anyone. It really depends on what you're doing. Uh, it can be a developer, a data scientist, a business analyst, a designer, a CEO. Even my grandma could be a user if it makes sense in the context of what I'm working on. Uh, so the first thing you want to do is, you know, who does, whatever you're doing, whether you're a data journalist creating a blog post, whether you're creating a new API, a new visualization engine, whatever it is, think about your user and first determine who are they. After you know who the user is, you want to kind of understand, you know, what does the user really want? And, you know, I, I don't want to brag, but I know what the user wants, and it doesn't matter what you're doing. In every case, I know what the user wants. Because the user wants Samantha from, to be Samantha from Bewitched. Uh, and if you don't know Bewitched, it's a sitcom from the 60s where this is Samantha, she's a witch, and all she had to do was wiggle her nose and she got whatever she wanted instantaneously. And I say this because oftentimes a user is going to use your tool, uh, consume your chart, and not really know what they want when they start, but halfway through the process they're going to realize, oh, I want to make that blue. You know, I want to zoom into this data. And, you know, how do you know that they want to do that? It's really hard to, to give everybody everything. In fact, it's impossible. So the, the, the question needs to, to change a little bit from what, you know, what the user really wants, because they want everything and they want it now, to you know, what's going to make the user happy. And this is actually really difficult to do, or at least it can be. 
And IBM uh, is devoting a lot of resources to this, uh, user research, user testing, user experience and UI designers, and just so much more. But don't worry, you don't need to be a part of a huge organization, you can even be a student. Just make sure, whatever you're doing, focus on the user before you start, think. Take five minutes, think, what does the user want? How are they gonna use this? How are they gonna consume it? So on and so forth. Design for the user. So here's a little workflow I created which is gonna guarantee uh, to make your user happy. First of all, you generate your hypothesis or idea. Again, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You can be a data journalist creating a blog, so it's a new blog post. It could be a new charting engine, so on and so forth. But create an awesome idea. And, and that's where you, where you always have to start. After that, implement it, make it real. And while you're doing so, always keep the user in mind, design for them. And then probably the most important part is you have to test your hypothesis. What I mean by test your hypothesis is launch. Put it in the user's hands, get it out there, post it on GitHub, publish your blog post, whatever it is, get users using it. And when you wanna say, okay, how am I doing, what's good, what's bad, don't just wave your hands and say, Sue said she liked this and Sue did not like that, so let's make that better. Let's invest our time in that. You don't do that. You can, but it's gonna be a risk. What you really wanna do is make data-driven decisions. You wanna look at the data. How are people actually using this tool or whatever it is? You know, where are they clicking? Where are they spending their time? Where are they getting stuck? Where are they dropping off? So, for example, let's say you're creating a, a tool to create a chart and it's a three-step process. Collect the data. Step one takes one minute on average. Step two takes one minute on average. Great, step one and two are performing really well. But if step three takes an average user 10 minutes and 50% of them drop off, you know that there's a problem in and around step three most likely. So then at that point, you start the process again. You make a new hypothesis, you go back to the start and you continue to iterate and iterate and iterate. And I guarantee you, you know, it might not be perfect. You might make some mistakes, but mistakes are okay. As long as you keep thinking about your user, keep making data-driven er, decisions, you're gonna make the user happy. So for example, uh, this is a picture on the bottom of my team. Uh, a, a few weeks ago, we actually all got together, spent a few days uh, to do a, a design workshop uh, where we just were asking the question, you know, who is our user? What problems are they trying to solve? What do they want? You know, even questions like, how are they gonna feel when they're using our tools? Uh, for us, it meant using a lot of stickies, having a lot of conversations, a few arguments. Uh, but you know, we invested the time just to discuss our user. And that doesn't mean that you have to do a design workshop. Oops. Uh, you might not have the resources. Again, you might just be a student. But what I want to really convey is invest the time, invest the mind, and think about your user. So now I have a quick example. How to display complex multi-dimensional data better. That's a problem that you know, lots of people are trying to solve. I'm sure lots of you are trying to solve this problem, at least in the context of what you work on. So here's a bunch of examples I scraped and pulled from around the web. On the left, we have uh, 3graphs.com. It just uses 3JS. It's just a simple you know, 3D map that you can rotate, uh, project it on your 2D screen. Similarly, in the top middle, I have uh, Plotly 3D. Uh, with a simple graph here. It has X, it has a Y, it has a Z. It also has a heat map on it. Uh, we have, or you can have, you know, just a whole bunch of tables, which is generally not a good idea. Uh, or even in the bottom left, I have LA Times created this a few years ago, actually five years ago. Uh, it's called the Centimeter. And if you don't know what it is, I, I'm not gonna show it now, but Google it, it's super cool. It shows Twitter sentiment analysis with a lot of different data that lets you go through time and see how sentiment changes over time and you know how many people are tweeting, it's really cool. But a team at IBM kind of went back to basics and said, okay, we have this problem. And, and they did exactly what I said. They made a, a hypothesis. And their hypothesis was, I think someone could really visualize data better if they could you know, hold it in their hands and look at it in real three space, not just project it on a 2D screen. So I'm gonna show a quick video, it's just two minutes of uh, what they did to solve this problem. Okay, sound isn't going through, but it doesn't matter.
The point is, it's just saying you have complex data. How do you visualize it? Pretty much just what I was saying. In order, so this is showing someone putting on a Microsoft HoloLens. If you know, it's an AR display which lets you see uh, something in augmented reality, and this is an actual. Uh, real life, just imagine they put a webcam on their head, what you see when you use the tool, and you actually can see a real chart in 3D in front of you. You can, you know, rotate it, make it bigger, make it smaller, uh, walk around it, uh, even collaborate, I believe, over long distances if someone else in another city has it and work on the exact same graph in real time. Uh, the point is, they made a decision and said, we think that we can make viewing multidimensional, in this case, you know, uh, geographical data better. And we think, and they made a hypothesis, and you know, I don't know if it's the right thing or the wrong thing. The point is, they did it, and they continue to iterate, and I tested it out in October, and it was A, super cool, and B, it actually was kind of very useful to understand, you know, how does my data look? The fact that you can lean into your data and actually view a part uh, without having to, you know, click, it's very intuitive. And being intuitive gave a great user experience, and giving a great user experience made a great tool. So. Uh, Unfortunately, they were supposed to be coming here so you could see it and try that headset on yourself. Uh, they had to cancel at the last minute, but if you're interested, please come talk to me. I can put you in touch with these guys because, honestly, it's one of those things that you really have to try for yourself. It's, it's really awesome. So now that I've kind of discussed user experience and, and why it's important to give the user the right experience, let me just talk about simplicity really quickly. So let me read this Steve Jobs quote. Simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple. But it's worth it in the end, because once you get there, you can move mountains. And while I might not be the biggest Steve Jobs fan, I, I truly love this quote, because it's so true. Uh, simplicity can be really hard, especially hard to get right, but if you can nail your simple design, it's going to be super powerful for the user. So simplicity isn't a, a, a one-edged sword. It, it does a lot of different things. It wears a lot of masks and comes in a lot of different flavors. For instance, simplicity might mean that your tool is intuitive and you don't need any instructions and you can just, you know, create without having to read anything, just like the iPhone. You don't need the manual. Simplicity can mean that you can get from A to B quicker. You don't need to invest as much time. Simplicity could just mean, you know, let's not clutter up the screen or whatever you're looking at. Let's just make less so you can focus on what's really important. And I truly think simplicity is logical. It's not just hand-waving. Let's make things simple. It, there's a real rational reason to do it. And uh, I'm a math major. That's my background. So I created a, a, a kind of not-so-great equation on why simplicity is logical. So you start with users who, and, and they want to do what they need. And, sorry, you get users to do what they need or do what they want. And if you can wrap that in a simple experience, you're going to give the user the results that they want and in turn save them time and save them sanity. And as long as you can get the user what they really want, and you save them time, save their sanity, you're just going to get a happy user. It's pretty straightforward. So to show you the power of simplicity, I'm going to show a demo, a quick demo of something called Pixie Dust. It's a tool for data scientists. Uh, it's actually open sourced, so uh, please uh, download it, play with it, contribute it. But what it's focused on, what its focus is on is making charting super simple for data scientists so they don't have to worry about any libraries. You know, am I going to use matplotlib? Am I going to use ggplot? Am I using bokeh? Whatever it is. Uh, it just simply wraps all that in a very simple interface. So here I am in a notebook as a data scientist. I like working in notebooks. Uh, this notebook is hosted in uh, IBM's uh, data science experience. So this is a, a a place where data science can come, work in notebooks, uh, do all, everything they'd want to do as a data scientist, work with Spark, so on and so forth. So in this notebook, I'm just going to show a really quick example. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to import Pixie Dust. And then you'll see right here in this cell, I use a Spark context, uh, and I turn a, create a SQL context out of it, and I create a Spark to SQL data frame. In this data frame, it's going to be really simple. It's going to have a couple arrays in the first array. I have one tuple with green and 75, the other tuple with blue and 25, and then the next array just says colors and percent. All I have to do in order to chart this is just call this display command, which is part of Pixie Dust, and pass in my Spark data frame. As soon as I run this, uh, Pixie Dust really does all the heavy lifting for me. 
I don't need to, you know, find any documentation. I don't need to know how to do anything other than to type DIS PLAY and automatically I get my chart here. 75% green, 25% blue. That's a really simple example. Let me show you something a little bit more complex. So here's another uh, data frame, just the same, a little bit more complex data. It has three tuples. So, you know, you have a year in the first column, some type of category in the second column. This is for like a sporting company. And then in the last column, we know how many customers are purchasing uh, from that category. And then at the end of it, we run display and display that data frame. So once again, uh, Pixie Dust is going to chart that data for you without you having to do anything. Let me zoom out a bit. Uh, but on top of just charting it, that's not all it does. In fact, that's really just scratching the surface. Uh, you can see at the top right, you can choose what renderer you want to render with. So I can choose matplotlib or I can just choose bokeh. And if I choose bokeh, there now I have my, the same data in bokeh graph. I can move it, do everything that you'd normally do in bokeh. But I don't need to learn a single line of bokeh code. Moreover, I can click right up here on the top left and choose a different type of chart that makes sense with my data. So let me choose a bar chart. And there you go, I have a bar chart. Again, not a single line of code. I, I think it's pretty straightforward how simple and easy this is. On top of that, and I won't dig into it, but you can go over options, you know, create, choose what keys, what values you want, how you want to aggregate the data, so on and so forth. This is an actually a really long notebook showing a, a whole ton of features that Pixie Dust has. Please come talk to us. We can show you this and so much more. Uh, for instance, you know, it has Pixie Dust and uh, works with Python and Scala and kind of merges the two together so you can, you know, install Scala packages and run them with Python. It does a whole heap of things to make data science really easy for a data scientist so they can focus on what I think they really care about and that's, you know, creating new algorithms and really exploring their data and trying to understand and create good insights rather than focusing on, you know, how do I chart? And once again, if I come to the bottom, you'll see Please contribute. If you have a renderer, you know you want to add your own cool renderer on top of matplotlib and bokeh, create a pull request. Easily it'll go in that drop down and now using Pixie Desk we can uh, generate charts with whatever renderer you've added in. Okay. Now we get to, to my bread and butter, B charts. So B charts is a pretty new prototype. It's still a prototype at IBM. Uh, and the idea is to make charting as simple as possible with the real goal of being the simplest charting tool on the internet. So one of the main concepts of B-Charts is that data is everywhere. It can be on your laptop in a USB key. Uh, it can be on social data, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can have open data like Socrata or Soda or government data, uh, IoT data, Nest, Fitbit, Raspberry Pis, and just so much more like REST APIs, databases like IBM's DashDB or the weather company data. Data's everywhere. And even though, even my grandma, who barely knows how to use a computer, she has access to terabytes and terabytes of Facebook data, open data, so on and so forth. But you know what? Taking data and moving to a chart can be really hard. So sometimes you don't have to do all these steps. Sometimes you have to do some more. But in general, going from data to a chart, you have to get the data, understand the data, prepare the data, work on the data. Then after you understand what the data looks like, choose your visualization. Uh, create that visualization, then share it. You know, this is very similar to one of those data science workflows or data science methodologies. The point is if you can do all of this from start to end, you're pretty much arguably a data scientist. But it's something that not anyone can do, not an average person. Maybe a developer, maybe a data scientist can do it, but, you know, my grandma definitely can't. So the goal to shrink this down to as simple as possible is to be able to create a chart in a single click. So this is a pretty hard goal to reach. It's pretty ambitious, but as a team, we keep this in the back of our minds always to be able to create a chart in one click. So in order to achieve this goal, we've done a few different things. One, we have concepts of data integrations, which will go to the various data sources, pull the data, prepare the data for you. Moreover, it'll use logic. So after it's pulled all that data, it'll analyze it for you, choose what's the best chart, uh, what are the best chart options for you. And also, we've created different user experiences and interfaces depending on what type of user you are. So if you're a data scientist, work in a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, if you're someone else, you can use the REST API, so on and so forth. And I'll hopefully be able to demo all of that or some of that for you. So at its core, B-Charts is two main parts. A website front end that you can click and create your charts. 
as well as a REST API in the back end, which lets you do everything that the front end does. So you can create your charts, modify the design, so on and so forth. And then we have the data integrations, as I mentioned in the middle. So it should be as easy as clicking create a Fitbit chart. B charts will pop up. Do you authorize Fitbit with the OAuth dialog? Do you authorize Fit or B charts to access your Fitbit data? You click OK. Without having to do anything else, you're instantly sent to your chart, which you can share, you can display, you can do whatever you want with. Also, as I mentioned, we have a variety of interfaces. Jupyter and Zeppelin notebooks we work in. We have a Chrome extension, a Slack command, so on and so forth. Anyways, now let me get to a demo to show you what this really looks like and how it really works. But I'm probably going to go right to the end. So if you have any questions, uh, whether it's for B charts, whether it's for Pixie Dust, whether it's for data science experience, whether it's about gerbils because you really like gerbils, please come. We're in the reception hall. We have the table at the back. Uh, and come talk to us. Okay, so this is the B charts front end. When you first hit B charts, this is what you see. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do here. We have a community of charts that you can share your charts in the community. Uh, favorite charts, find recent charts. In a chart, you can you know, favorite it, tag it, duplicate it, view it, do whatever you want. But you know what? I'll, I'll focus on creating charts because I think that's what the most interesting thing is. So the first example that I'm going to show you is you just have a CSV file on your, cube, on your computer. All you need to do to create a chart is simply take this file and drag and drop it onto B charts. And what BCharts is going to do, it's going to pull all that data for you, analyze it, like I said, choose the best chart type it can possibly choose. And here it says, okay, your, chart lo or your data looks like it would be best suited for a line chart. On top of that, it will determine all of the possible chart types that possibly make sense for your data. So for example, pie charts, you need at least one column for like a label and another column for the value of that slice. And if you don't have any numeric columns, you can't do a bar chart, so it won't be shown. And the idea of B charts is we want to get you here as soon as possible. And we're going to do our best guess to get, you, to get you the best chart possible. And at which point you can now come in here and customize it if we made any mistakes, which, you know, we probably will. Uh, you can modify the title of the chart. You can do X axis, Y axis. You can tag the chart. You can modify the styles, like the colors, the legends of the chart. You can look at or modify the data of the chart modify the data mappings, which I'll sh demonstrate later with probably a little bit better of an example. And then uh, my, I, what I think is the most interesting thing that you can do is share your chart. So immediately, as soon as you create this chart, it's automatically shared everywhere. You have a direct link to the chart, which you can send people. You have embed code, which you can embed in your blog. You can render your chart as an image. Or you can even import that chart directly into the data science experience into a notebook. So what does it mean to import that chart into a notebook? So you click that button. What it does is it creates a notebook for you in the data science experience, just like this. Uh, the first line, it will download and install the BCharts client. So just the normal pip install. This is a Python notebook. Next, what it's going to do is it's going to fill in your credentials, your client ID, and your secret key of BCharts. It also passes in SC, which is our Spark context because the, the BCharts Python client already works with Spark. And then it's going to fill in the uh, chart ID of whatever chart you were working on and to create a chart object. So just by saying, sorry, just by running chart equals client.chart passing in the chart ID. And then all you need to do to view your chart is just call chart.render. And now this chart uh, shows up directly in your notebook. Moreover, you can call chart.renderdesigner to render the chart designer directly in the notebook. The idea being if you're a data scientist, you don't want to keep going back and forth between uh, a web page and the notebook. You want to stay where you're comfortable. And where you're comfortable is in a notebook. So the other cool thing of BCharts is that, yes, you're seeing this chart in a notebook. But if I was also looking, if let's say I also embedded it in my blog. So for instance, let me open a direct link to this chart, this donut chart I just opened. I have it right here. All places that I'm viewing this chart are updated in real time and are all synced with each other. So for instance, if I come into my notebook or on the website or with the API or however I want to do it and change this to, let's say, a pie chart and then save my chart, not only is it updated in my notebook above, but anywhere I've shared this chart, whether it's embedded in my blog or anywhere, it's updated in real time. Moreover, in the notebook, you can get data from your chart, 
uh, as both a normal Python object, as a Spark data frame. You can add data into your chart. You can set data in your chart. The idea being you can create a chart that's empty to start with if you want. Uh, use Spark, create some data, and run that Spark job continuously, and it'll feed data into your chart so that chart moves and updates in real time everywhere it's displayed. Okay, let me give you another quick example of different interfaces we've thought about to make the user's life easier and more simple. Say you're browsing the web. Here I am on MLB.com looking at catchers from the Oakland Athletics. And I'm not into saber metrics. I don't really know what all these stats mean, but I kind of want to understand, you know, who are the better players. I want to visualize this. What would you normally do? You'd, you know, highlight all this data, copy and paste it into Excel, create a chart or Plotly or whatever it is. Uh, but we have a Chrome extension. You simply click the B, choose parse HTML. It parses the whole web page, finds all the tables, and then you can simply click the B. Automatically, the extension uses the REST API in the back end, sends all the data to B charts, and creates your chart. So now here you go. I have a multi-bar chart. I can see all the different, the three players and all their different stats. I only have a couple more minutes, so let me just show you a couple more things. Another cool thing about the data is not only can you modify it here, but you can also have a concept of live data updates. So for instance, if you point B charts to a, a database, uh, you can say, let's pull from this database every day or every minute or every hour. And what's going to happen is automatically with you ha without you having to write a single line of code, Bcharts is going to use that data integration and continuously pull that data. It's going to update in the chart designer. It's going to update on any blog posts I have. It's going to update everywhere in real time. And finally, with my last minute, I'm going to show you we have a, a, Slack, ex or a Slack command. You do slash Bcharts help in Slack. And you'll see we can do these are all the integrations we have right now for bcharts. Uh, you can either, if you have a chart already, you can just chart that chart directly in Slack. We have Google Spreadsheet integration. Uh, let me do something simple. Actually, you know what? Let me do something not so simple. Uh, we support DB2 or dash DB. So here's one uh, command I can use, slash bcharts. Let's use our DB2 integration. We can pass in a SQL statement and a JDBC URL. Uh, to connect to our data, and then also say we want this as a multi-bar chart. Enter this in directly into Slack, and again, what's going to happen is uh, the Slack command is going to talk to bcharts API, uh, the RESTful API, and create our chart, again, a real bchart, and hopefully if everything works, is going to spit that chart into the Slack page. Oh, no. Okay, good. So, hmm. so it's supposed to show up here, uh, but it didn't. Uh, let me just try one really quick example and do Twitter sentiment analysis. So let's pass hashtag equals plotcon. So this is actually going to talk to the Twitter API using Watson and do a sentiment analysis on how people are tweeting about plotcon, kind of risky. Hopefully it's very positive. Uh, and feed that chart into, okay, good. And we have our, our pie chart of the Twitter sentiment analysis. We have buttons to say update this, meaning go back to Twitter and pull on a, on a frequency, so every hour, every six hours. And once again, I can click the link and have a real B chart. Again, I can embed this on my blog, so on and so forth. I think my time is done, uh, but please come talk to us. Again, we're at the back of the reception. Uh, I'd love to go over more of this demo with you, talk about anything else. Uh, thank you very much.